right, it's good to be here. I'm looking around. So last time I talked at TSMC, there was like 10 people in the room, and I think half of them were cardboard cutouts. So it's really nice to be with people again. It's beautiful. And the other thing, I asked them if uh, there would be a monitor where I could see my presentation, and I want to tell you there are six. TSMC goes big on everything. So it's, it's a beautiful thing. So they asked me to talk about designing in the modern ecosystem, and I thought, like, what, what are we doing next year? And I decided to talk about problems I'm working on. And uh, when I sent the, the, the title over, they said, problem sounds a little bit negative. And then I thought, well, first of all, problems are why we have jobs, right? And, uh, you know, so we better love problems. And then, of course, from being engineers, when we solve problems, we create new problems that are actually harder than the old ones. And that's uh, yeah, working out pretty good. But like designing today, you know, some things are so good, but we've created some new problems. And, and I, I've been stewing on how, what to do about that. And then I saw a couple of articles like this, which, which also inspired me because you know, Jensen's right about almost everything. He's one of the most visionary technology leaders on the planet. And he said Moore's Law is becoming obsolete, which, which I don't personally believe. Um, and then Naveen Rao, I worked with Naveen, who built a very large AI chip. And he said it's dead. And this always kind of surprises me. So I've been thinking about problems are interesting, because there's easy problems, right? There's solvable problems, there's impossible problems, right? And our mission is to solve hard problems and then turn impossible problems into solvable. That makes sense, right? So is it fundamental, or is there a problem to solve? And I, and I was stewing on this one. So this curve is the energy of a photon versus wavelength of light. And as we make things smaller, ideally, we have to use smaller wavelengths of light. And what you would have really preferred is, as the wavelength got smaller, the energy got smaller. And instead, the opposite's happening. Like, this is like a terrible curve. Right. This is a fundamental hard problem. So we want to make things smaller, and actually what's happening is it's getting worse. Right. So technology has some real hard limits. The uncertainty from small wavelengths, the energy to create that. But we have a whole bunch of problems that are actually implementation issues and challenges, and then we have things that are habits. Right. Now I'm confident about this because Three nanometer transistor is something by like a thousand by a thousand by a thousand atoms. That's a billion atoms. I know we know how to shrink that, right? And biology says DNA can sequence atoms at a molecular atomic level at very low energy. We have a proof point that we can pattern things at a very small geometry. It already exists. The wildest thing about biology is like the brain is the most computationally dense low power method, and every cell contains a factory that creates an entire brain. That's amazing, right? We think factories are bigger than the things they make. And in DNA, the factory is actually inside every cell. So I'm confident we can solve these things, right? But this talk is about designing today. So I thought, like, what do I have? So I said this is going to be 10 problems when I wrote the started working on the talk, I had 20, but I pared it down a little bit. And so what kind of problems do I have? Which IP should I use? What does it cost? Is it available? How do I build it? How do I solve my memory bandwidth problems? What do I do about CPU technology in a world where things are changing really fast? What am I going to do about software? We're building an AI processor and a RISC-V processor. So there's a lot of new software ecosystem there. And what are we going to do with AI in the design space? I'm not going to talk about AI computers today, but how do we use it? And the list goes on and on and on. And these are challenges. Some of these challenges are created by new technology, right? TSMC makes a denser node. You have a whole bunch more transistors. You need new CAD tools to go solve that problem. Like, our solutions create problems. And then we keep going. So we're really good at some things. We're really good at PPA. We're really good at shrinking everything. So you have a, a design, and there's a new node, and then you shrink everything. And engineers love to do everything ourselves, especially big companies. 
right? But to get what we want faster, I think it's, we need to do a few things a little differently. So I bucketed this out in the four things for this talk. You know, what are we gonna do about IP? How are we gonna leverage chiplets to go make progress in better products faster? What's going on in open source? And then finally, AI. So I compared uh, IP design last year to buying stuff from Home Depot, right? So what's Home Depot? Home Depot is a tools and material company, right? You go there to buy tools and materials and make your own stuff, right? So today, if you're building an SOC, you buy IP from people, maybe you design some IP, you get some CAD tools, you put that together. When your design's ready, you send it to Fab, you test it, and then you ship it, right? And if your goal is an A0 tape out with really high quality IP uh, metrics, you're crazy. Like, like this, this is working pretty well. This gets results, but this is fairly expensive, right? We, we're, Tenstorrent, we're building our third chip. We're, we're buying IP for DDR, PCI Express, Ethernet, again, and we're building it again. Right, we have three chips and we've implemented, we, we improve features, but we're doing it again, right? I realized when we were building the Tesla chip, um, really exciting project, went great, great partnership on IP and technology. We had a standard CPU, a standard GPU, a standard memory controller, a standard PCI Express controller, and I had to buy all those things, put them in a chip and build it again. All right, so why are we doing this? I think the number one reason is we're stubborn. Um, engineers get really good at doing what they're doing. I've met so many engineers, they've been working on a CAD tool methodology or a software strategy or an IP, and after they get really good at doing it for five or 10 years, they wanna keep doing it. But we're re redoing things we've already done. We're redoing things other people have done better, and it's expensive and it delays our products. So we've been thinking a lot about chiplets, and there's a bunch of consortiums working on this. We're talking to some startups, some CAD companies, some other people. There's a bunch of leveraging technology. There's new packaging that supports fine pitch, bumps, right? We can do chiplets today with silicon interposers. It ends up being really expensive and fairly complicated. So when we drive this down to a really fine pitch so we can put dies together, there's a startup called Silicon Box, which has a very large panel very fine substrate, a bunch of people are working on this, it's pretty cool. If the chips are close together, we can use low power, really small size. There's a number of consortiums, bunch of wires, UCIE. IP quality now is so high that you could say, here's an IP in a chiplet and I expect to be able to use it without having to change it. Five years ago when you sourced a bunch of IP, you knew when you integrated it, you simulate it, do integration testing, you report a couple bugs, you get a couple drops and do it. But IP quality today is getting really good. The key to going forward is we need an interoperability specs. If you build a chiplet, you'd really like to sell that to 10 people. Today, the IP models you make IP, you sell it to 10 people. But in the chiplet world, you can make a chiplet and sell it to 10 people. And that would be really effective. And then tools to support that. So a chiplet flow is similar. The chip you want to build, you, you do IP development, CAD, build it, fab it. But if you could then buy a chiplet for memory controller, CPU, AI, FPGA, then you integrate that at package. This means a whole bunch of people who want custom solutions can now get them. You don't have to source a whole bunch of technologies. Right? You don't have to build things that other people are already built and you can even mix technologies together. TSMC, Samsung, Intel, they come up with a new technology and the really high volume products, you, you really want to integrate everything together and you can afford spinning the DDR5 to the 15th dime, right? But with bigger products, you just want to change your IP or maybe even buy chiplets and use an FPGA to customize it. It's a very different thing. And if you only move the central IP, the advanced technology node, it changes the dynamics of that technology node. Here's an example. 
So we have a single AI chip. And we talked to a bunch of customers. The requirements for the same AI engine, we have spec ranging from eight gigabytes to two terabytes. DRAM bandwidth from 100 gigabytes a second to four terabytes a second. And on-chip memory requirements, what they would like from 100 megabytes to two gigabytes, right? If we had to make chips to cover those, they'd either be very expensive because they have everything, or we'd have to do multiple spins just to get something that's like a DRAM option. So in a chiplet kind of world, you could have a DDR5 controller, an HBM controller, GDR6 controller. We're looking at some options to have a memory controller with very large chip cache. That's really impl uh, implementation and uh, market specific. And you could even do a combo controller. Like just look at these package pictures. So HBM on a silicon interposer, unbelievably great bandwidth, super expensive. GDR6 on a, GDR5 I think this is, on a low cost PCI Express card, that's reasonable, but the capacity is limited. In modern servers, you can put terabytes of DRAM in there at, at fairly low cost, but they're really different solutions. All right, so IP kind of works. We like it. We think chiplets are going to change how we do stuff. And the next piece is open really wins. You know, I was at digital equipment when digital had a great version of, of Unix. HP had Unix, Sun had Unix, IBM had Unix. And there was this little toy called Linux. And there was a little toy called GCC. And it slowly boiled the ocean because when we build advanced designs, you know, there's, there's things where it's really focused and intense but there's problems that are really big, right? So we solve complicated problems two ways. One is we break them down into pieces. The other is we get a lot of people working on it. The one wild thing about open source is it amortizes the cost over a lot of people. I think chiplets are gonna have that effect as well, but open really wins. We're building a RISC-V processor and we've been participating in the open source RISC-V world. Um, so Escalon is the name of our processor. We're gonna build it eight wide. It's configurable to be four and six wide. This could be a very high-end processor. But there's also Boom and Rocket Cores. They're open source. We downloaded them from Berkeley. We put them in our test environment, started running it. They're great, right? They're open, they're flexible, right? Open is starting to drive the industry on a whole bunch of IP. And RISC-V is, is leading the charge and then we started building it, and if you're building a new processor from scratch, you need a reference model, test generators, test benches, infrastructure, tools, compiler, operating system, applications, vectorizing libraries. In RISC-V, we just started downloading it. Linux works, LLVM works, GCC works. We have a spec FP number. Spec FP traditionally is challenging because you need a vectorizing compiler. There's a whole bunch of tool chain support for that. RISC-V is a relatively new architecture with a new vector spec. We downloaded that. Actually, the numbers are really good, right? There's reference model, Whisper, and Spike. We support Whisper, Spike's open source. Um, test environments, Google open source uh, test generator, which we use. We've also open sourced some of our architectural and COSIM reference models. There's an open source emulation environment. And now we're starting to play with open road and open PDN, which are open source physical design kits. So open source generates a lot of energy. So there's a RISC-V forum this year. Ted Storen submitted seven papers and we only had two accepted and I was a little nicked about it. So we called them up and they said, we had so many submissions, we could only give so many papers to each company. Like there's no x86 forum. There's nothing like that kind of energy going into ARM these days. Like RISC-V is, is going everywhere, but it's because it's open source. And that changes how we think about things, right? I, I was talking to a guy who said, one of the problems, the promises of RISC-V is you can have a design, you can make modifications to do what you want. It reminded me of years ago, we were using NT to run some CAD tools and the print driver didn't work and we called up Microsoft and filed a bug and a year later it still didn't work. And we had already switched to Linux and a bunch of stuff didn't work. And we called up our friends and they sent us patches and we fixed it. Like it was a natural act to extend the operating system to solve the problem that you had. And if it didn't work, you could just reach in and fix it.
So chiplets are going to change the world about how we build chips. So if you go buy a server part or a client part or a mobile part, you're sort of buying the CPU, but it comes packaged with a whole bunch of features. Right? We tend to think of a server as processors plus memory controller, PCI Express, this, that, and the other thing. Right? But CPUs are actually independent of SOC features. Imagine a world where you bought the CPU, you bought the I.O. system, you bought the network accelerator separately. Then CPUs can focus on what they need to do. There's fast and efficient, there's lots of options, they need to be ready to change. One reason we picked RISC V is our first problem was we wanted to add data types for AI to a processor, and ARM and some other guys said no. And we're like, what do you mean no? It's like eight lines of RTL code. Like, no is not a good answer. Yes would have been a great answer. Like, already done would have been a great answer. Like, in a time of intense innovation, things are gonna change faster. I think we're gonna see a lot more designs in this space. And we hope to enable that. And we also hope to work with a lot of companies that are into doing really great individual pieces of technology so we can start to build interesting solutions out of a bunch of components. So here's an example, and this is where we're aiming, right? So we're gonna solve some of our cost problems by putting only the silicon that needs advanced node, like three nanometer and three nanometer. Like this, this could be a chiplet package, CPU, AI, network accelerator, DDR controller. We can buy things off the shelf, that's our goal. Our time to market is, is on the critical IP, not validated in the 30s that somebody else already built. We think hardware is behind the software world. Software, those guys really know how to architect APIs, how to plug things together and we need to really get there in the hardware front. So I think the ecosystem going forward is gonna think about this more and more carefully. And you heard the TSMC talks this morning, you know, how do you stack technologies? How do you put more IP together? How do you make this faster? And I think chiplets are gonna be a big part of it. All right. IP was good, chiplets are good, open's good. AI is starting to win everything. And I've been thinking about like AI is a problem solving tool. So some tools are incremental, like you have five million gates and you wanna get to seven million gates and they tweak the CAD tools, right? Solving problems with AI is like solving problems with dynamite, right? It's, it's a completely different idea. Like everything that AI starts to touch is going to be radically different. It's gonna change faster than any of us think. Right. We started using GitHub Copilot, and people said, it's ridiculously easy to write all the mechanical parts of our test bench, which is gonna change radically how we even build them. So, it's already happening. People are using AI and CAD tools for layout, test generation, code generation. We're gonna try to reproduce our small RISC-V processor from AI. Like, I'm not kidding, this is going, to, we're going to, I love the demonstration from OpenAI about writing a computer game by talking to a GPT-3 interface. Like that's gonna happen in the next year, right? And there's a website or a YouTube channel called Two Minute Papers. He says this rule is if it's good, it's just two papers away from being great. And this is gonna happen pretty fast. So for everybody doing design, here's something to think about. How long will it take before half your design is working with AI? Like maybe some of you are already there. Maybe some of you today, the number is zero. I think it's less than five years. Maybe it's two. So first of all, problems are fun, right? Problems give us jobs. That's actually why we're engineers. Engineers solve problems and you know, we cause them as fast as possible. You know, it's really crazy. The mindset about this is really important. If you think something's unsolvable, it will not get solved. Solving problems is partly about believing you can solve everything. And sometimes that means you have to push through the fundamentals. Ignore little details like the wavelength of light energy problem. We think chiplets are coming. It's the natural step after high quality IP. It's part of our solution to time the market. The cost problem on advanced nodes, 
Like the cost problem on advanced notice is a real problem. Those, that equipment's super expensive. That's not a problem we just go, oh well. That's a problem we're, we're gonna go solve it, right? That's what we always do. You have a problem, you solve it. Open is going to win everywhere, and it's, it's happening everywhere. And there's opportunity for people to open up their technology, get more people on the platform. And again, TSMC just said, open innovation platform, that's what makes things happen. And then AI is gonna change everything, you know. I like this picture because I believe we're gonna get to, you know, we're, we say three nanometer, there's a factor of, I don't know, somewhere between 10 and 100, maybe 1,000. If we drew the 100 picometer transistor on there, you wouldn't be able to see it on this slide. But that's coming pretty soon. Okay, great, that's my talk for today. Thank you very much for listening.